Hey. It's 420 somewhere, and right now that somewhere is right here. So hello, and welcome to the Cannabis Show. My name, producer Vince, and here's your host, Ricardo Baca. <laughs> oh man, I think everybody should have their name said in that like Ed McMahon style <laughs> intro. It's too everybody funny. tweet me, I'll send you a personal one for Christmas. Oh, I dig it. Thank you for that, Vince. To everybody joining us today, welcome to the Cannabis Show, where we talk about all things weed. Hashtag all things weed. That is the serious cannabis news and the fun stuff as well. Uh, in fact, if you pop onto the Cannabis right now, you can read stories about the $1.4 million in pot taxes that might be refunded to cannabis customers in this one Colorado county. That does not mean Colorado's making so much money they're giving it back. It does not, <laughs> no, but check out the story and see what it does mean. Uh, about why more American women are using marijuana during their pregnancies, even though its potential harms on newborns are relatively unknown. A lot of people ask this of my pregnancy baby mama to be and she is not she is not the answer is no yeah, uh, and also catches up why is this dollhouse shop selling miniature doll scale bungs Vince and why have I not gone out and bought 10 yet <laughs> Ricardo <laughs> they're pretty cheap man <laughs> and you know if you have that stoner doll kicking around your dollhouse I was seeing some kind of a stop-motion <laughs> animation thing happening out of it <laughs> oh yes I could Oh, I could see that happening say, yeah, on a future episode of The Cannabis <laughs> Show. Uh, Vince, how are you doing, man? Well, I'm suddenly realizing that I signed myself up to make a stop-motion animation sometime <laughs> in the future of The Cannabis Show, so I'm tired, but looking forward to it. Ricardo, how are you been, man? <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I think we should we should use my old Gumby figurine from when I was a kid. Yeah, we could do great <laughs> stuff, dude. This old, uh, We can make Nightmare Before Christmas Part 2 with bongs. And see what happens <laughs> in uh, the <laughs> land of Halloween. <laughs> uh, I'm good, Vince. I appreciate you asking. You know, shoot, just busy. I know. Just finishing up Christmas shopping. What am I gonna get my nephew? He's at that funny stage. He's like a freshman in high school, and he's like, I don't want anything. Donated so. his name to a needed charity, especially right now in our political uh, climate, uh, Ricardo. Yeah, there you go. I think he might be getting an ACLU membership at the very <laughs> least, but. Vince, I think it's time to jump right into the Week in Weed, but first, Vince, do I hear that you have a surprise for us at the end of this Week in Weed? You know, as we jump into the beginning of it, I can't wait to get to the end of it, because earlier <laughs> this year, I interviewed one of 13-year-old Vince's favorite bands, and I ended the year by interviewing one of 13-year-old Vince's favorite filmmakers, and it went great. Ah, yeah, okay, a okay. Tease. <laughs> nice little tease. Can't wait to find out who exactly this is. So let's let's start the week in weed in Canada, where police have been raiding dispensaries and arresting the people running the pot shops all over the country. Yeah, and Ricardo, I saw this news but didn't quite understand it. Just last week, we talked about Canada's historic movement toward a legal and regulated recreational, recreational, recreational cannabis market and now all these arrests and this stuff what's happening you know it's slightly confusing on the surface but it makes more sense when you dig in uh, here's the truth of Canadian marijuana right now it's still legal medically for sure but it's still illegal recreationally even though these conversations are happening so when some of these adult use businesses started popping up and across the country last week they knew that they were breaking the law and the stunts would likely land them in jail which they did and I think, in fact, that was the point for many of these activists, including Canada's self-proclaimed, mind you, Prince of Pot, Mark Emery. Weed royalty, people, according to him. <laughs> I mean, I know Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, a.k.a. Bay, is very pro-legalization, <laughs> but his response to the raids and arrests was very black and white. Quote, until we've changed the law, the current laws exist and still apply. There you go. And elsewhere in the weekend weed, we now have a better idea of who is getting high in America Me. than we've ever had in the <laughs> recreational era. And the results might surprise you, not the part about Vince getting high, because we all knew that. You kind of do, and I kind of know how much Ricardo loves this kind of data, so let's dig in. It's the kind of data that tell us, tells us what legalization means for our communities and our habits and so on and so on, and really nerdy stuff Ricardo digs. And this is the mother load, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is based on more than 45 
thousand responses. You know, I do love this you data. Do it, well, man. And 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 Vince, let's go back to 2014 and think about a very different era because hell, remember that? Like we were about to legalize weed, we legalized weed, and then everybody wanted to know what it meant, including us. We're journalists. It's our job to put this in perspective. And yet, you know, if, if whether I'm talking to my mom or talking on CNN, it was like this is very early. We know nothing. There's literally no data out there. And now, state level data, federal level data, it's so exciting, Vince. Yeah, and now we have multiple years of data at all those levels, too, including this latest batch. And this latest batch is particularly fascinating. Some of the most interesting findings from this latest national survey includes this factoid. Marijuana use among baby boomers increased by 58% from 2006 to 2013 and by 250% for senior citizens in that same time period. No way. Among the 50 and older set, white and black folks are equally likely to get stoned, but nearly twice as likely as older Latinos. And also among the older set, the widowed and single folks are also the most likely to get high because they probably have more time on their hands, followed by the married seniors, <laughs> with the divorced and separated folks trailing as the least likely and least fun demographic to get stoned. Oh man, <laughs> uh, I can't overemphasize how important this data is, uh, and I also can't wait to see some more federal and state level data. We will keep you abreast of it here at The Cannabis. This is some of the most important information being released in drug policy right yes, now. It so, is. elsewhere in the Weekend Weed, our vaporizer critic Chris Thomas is in love with this new portable vape. It's called the DaVinci IQ, <laughs> but instead of us telling you all about it, here is Chris with his brief video review. The next generation of portable vapes are here, and the latest to hit the market is the DaVinci IQ. Following up its popular Ascent model, DaVinci's new vape is smaller but much more powerful. A host of operation modes and a powerful app allow you to tailor your sessions how you see fit, and updates in the future will enable further functionality. This model is about design and does an exceptional job of avoiding shortcomings while enabling enthusiast users. While a micro USB charging port and standard battery mean easy upkeep. The mouthpieces of the IQ can easily be swapped in and out if you'd like to use a water pipe or use an accessory. The herb chamber is funneled for easy loading and cleaning, and the vapor path is a durable zirconium instead of fragile glass. And even if your sessions tend to run a bit long, you shouldn't have to worry about the IQ overheating. And if you'd like to know more about the DaVinci IQ, check out Chris's full review at thecannabis.co, of course. Uh, but Vince, I think it's time for that surprise you'd mentioned. You know, it is kind of a cool surprise, and let's go to it, brother. My, uh, my, the DPTV intern, Michael Trujillo, and myself, we had a really exciting Thursday night when, between sets down at the infamous Comedy Works in downtown Denver, we had the opportunity to hang out with the man behind Clerks, Mall Rats, Dogma, Jersey Girl, which we did not talk about for very long. That's right, <laughs> Kevin Smith gave us a little bit of time to talk ah, hot yeah. parenting and pop culture between sets and, you know, while he's on tour doing his Q&As that he does now. And, you know, here it is. Last time I was here, I went to a store and I was like, get me weed. And they're like, do you have a doctor's recommendation? I'm like, what the fuck? I thought it was legal. And they're like, it isn't a recreational store. This is a medical dispensary. And I was like, oh, oh my bad. When I was younger, like I didn't become a stoner until I was 38. So I never understood why stoners liked those movies so much. Yes, I understood, hey, Jane, Silent Bob are weed dealers. But I never understood, like, why do people like these movies? Then when I started, be, like age 38, I became a wake and baker. And prior to that, Maybe you could count on two hands the amounts I, I smoked over the course of my life. Like we, I was raised in the, don't, the just say no era of Nancy Reagan and stuff, so weed was as bad as cocaine, and, as they told us in the 80s. But generally speaking, when I think of a stoner, the stoner that turned me into a stoner was Seth Rogen. My vampire Lestat was, was Seth Rogen because he was a functioning, first functioning stoner I ever met. So I was like, man, that's against the stereotype. I didn't think, like, oh, fuck, that's going to be some place where they're going to be like, it's Jay and Silent Bob. <laughs> and even more so because I'm fucking dressed like the character. <laughs> so she's looking at us both, man, and I was like, hey, how are you? And she's like, I didn't know if you guys were real. And I was like, <laughs>
I think it's generous to call it Jay and Silent Bob characters. <laughs> when most of us just say they're fucking cartoons. Do I regret those movies at all? Not at all. Like, you know, there's, they're fun, you know, to say the least. But is that a portrayal of a stoner? Like, no. They're, they're like the Cheech and Chong version of a stoner. Uh, the Bob and Doug McKenzie version of a stoner. While I was in Denver, Colorado Springs, Port Collins, every night we did a show, either Jay and Silent Bob get older or Q&A. I was always kind of just at one point shouting out the audience going like, you guys were the model. Look, a model, they can be fucking civilized and smoke weed and they didn't burn up the fucking state or anything. <laughs> so because there were no stories of like, they legalized fucking weed in, Cal in Colorado and then eight people ate a baby the next day. <laughs> Because there wasn't anything like that, California just went legal as well. So, excellent fucking job. They check your license even if you're buying a grinder. Like, they're just insanely, at least the store I went to, it was insanely uh, stringent about things. And not in a bad way, where I'm like, this is ridiculous. And they kept walking me through it, going like, you know, it's just, we follow the regulations to the letter. So I, I was not like, what is this? I can't believe what kind of world we live in. I can't open my weed in my car. Like... These are minor, like, rules to have to follow. Just like, you know, there was always, there've always been rules, rules for alcohol as well, you know, and they're very minor, and it's nice to see everyone follow them. I don't, I didn't, in my interactivity with it, the entire system this week that I've been here, I didn't find one flaw. Very cool. You know, of course, I loved Kevin Smith's early films so <laughs> much. Uh, but finally, here is our colleague Alicia Wallace with this week's quick hit. The DEA recently raised alarm in the marijuana industry about how it views CBD. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration put out a notice on the Federal Register that it plans to track marijuana extracts with a new code number. The agency went on to say that it is maintaining the Schedule I status for derivatives of marijuana and hemp. We talked with the DEA and industry compliance and business experts about what this three-page document means to producers, retailers, and consumers of extracts and CBD. DEA spokesman Russell Baer noted that the final rule is the result of something that's been in the works for five years and is meant to improve the agency's internal accounting mechanisms. The move is not a signal that the DEA is changing its enforcement stance, he said. Noting that the, quote, sky is not falling, industry experts did caution that the new code for extracts could create complications down the road. Quote, other agencies might interpret the new code to mean that somehow products produced from hemp are illegal, said Eric Steenstra, who heads the Hemp Industries Association. Steenstra and cannabis attorney Bob Hoban both said that they are reviewing the notice to determine whether to take legal action prior to the rule taking effect on January 13, 2017. For The Cannabis, I'm Alicia Wallace with this week's Quick Hit. Thank you, Alicia. And now it's time to bring out our first guest. He co-founded the cannabis growing competition known as The Grow Off, but he's also our lead cannabis critic. It's my pleasure to welcome out Jake Brown to The Cannabis Show. Hey, <laughs> hey brother, how's it going? Good to see you. What's up, man? It's the holiday season. I come bearing gifts for both you and producer Vince. Oh, that's, that's always fun. TV, heads up, man. Boom. <laughs> hey, thanks, Jake. And for wow, you. Wow, that's so thoughtful. And, uh... Jeez, you know, thanks, everyone man. else can fight over the bag. <laughs> <laughs> man, dude, last holiday, uh, you got you guys gave me an unintentional gift when after I'd thrown my back out, and you and your lady showed up to a, a holiday party with that thing, and I still sit on it. That thing is amazing. What we have old men joy? problems, don't oh we? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you become an old man. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm glad that it's still working for you, though. Yeah, dude, You're as limber thoughtful. as ever. Thank you, my friend. Of course. Good to have you back <laughs> on the couch. And again, I'm going to ask you the same question that I've... I know, this might be a new couch that... He has uh, not sat on that couch. Yeah. To it. <laughs> it's, it's a little more like comfy. Back. <laughs> I thought it had too much lean too, but Ben said we're good with it, so whatever. Right, he runs the studio, you know. <laughs> um, Indica Sativa. I'm doing Sativa. Has anything changed? Sativa for the holidays. You want to be oh. energetic. You want to have, <laughs> you know, you want to be talking to people. You're out there, you're mixing it up. You're at a holiday party. Uh, and you want something that's chatty, something that's upbeat, something that people may look at you a little stranger. Like, what's this guy? 
guy on. Give me a couple of hits of it. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I definitely felt that way the other night at the cannabis holiday party. Oh, yeah. I think I was talking poor Professor Pat's wife's ear <laughs> off. And at one point, she just like gave me a look, a little crinkle of the eyebrow. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, have I been talking straight for like three minutes? And then I was like, so yeah, that's the end of my story, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Just like a really natural cutoff to, so I mean, the sativa doesn't come with, with without its uh, awkwardness in, in, in holiday conversation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes the indica is good if you just want to be like the turn and nod, like, okay. Yeah. It's good for interacting with sativas sometimes. There's that, the that's what I was at the cannabis <laughs> holiday party, was just smiling and nodding the whole time. <laughs> um, so does this mean that you're prepping for for a post-holiday come down via Indica, maybe in early January? Oh God, I, well, I mean, this is my 2016 kitten because I feel like this is how I feel right now. I'm just like, is it over yet? <laughs> then 2017, just know that I've been good. If you're out there watching 2017, <laughs> know this guy's coming for you. I love it, dude. Maybe with a little Indica. And that's a cute kitten, too. It is. Not as cute as Pugs, my cat, but, and you know this. <laughs> Pugs is putting it on, man. <laughs> Nor will we crash in your cat, cat. But Jesus, you're like, it's a winter coat, and I'm like, that's a winter parka. At it's best, just man. a that giant. Is... We'll, sh we'll shave his coat again, and you'll see he's just a svelte young man inside there, <laughs> inside all that Mancun cat. fur. But, uh, Jake, let's start by talking about 20, 000, 2016 being the year of the awful bud tender. Shame on you, As you, you wrote. Tenders. Oh, shame on the bud tenders. Uh, so much so that it inspired you to write a column titled The Ten Bud Tender Commandments. What happened this year? Why, why were these bud tenders falling apart? I think what really led to this falling off a cliff was you had people that never knew the medical side of dispensaries, assume that everybody's just coming in to buy recreationally. And so there was a decreased focus on product knowledge, uh, on being able to talk about different things, but in a clear way uh, that these people had been in the industry for, uh, you know, I started off in 2010. So there are people that are bud tending with six years of real experience out there that were used to dealing with patients, knowing different ailments, knowing how these strains affected people. And now the, the mentality is so much more turn them and burn them, you know, get people in, get their order, show them one, two jars and then get them out because they have long lines. You know, it's not easy being a bud tender out there, uh, but you know, they're trying to, the, the emphasis is how quickly can we get people in and get them out? And so you lose a lot when that becomes your focus. And you know, you, I remember emailing with you, didn't mm -hmm. I forward you a reader's comment? Uh, and I say, hey, maybe this is a column, and didn't that column end up becoming this one? Yeah, so there was someone that was out there and just said, listen, I've really noticed things falling off a cliff. And that mirrored what my experience was. Because I'm going out there, I'm in shops all the time, and you know, there's just people that blank stares when you ask them pretty, pretty simple questions, right? Like, you know, what's the lineage of this strain? Uh, because, you know, sometimes they have something that's very boutique on the shelf, something maybe they came up with. Sure. And so for it to be a housebred strain, and they're like, well, I don't know, I'll go check the binder. I'm like, oh, you can't check the binder, man. Come on, man. <laughs> or they read to you from the card, yeah. Flip it around, and it's, uh, I mean, there's like a base level knowledge that you need to have to do this job well. And, and I feel like a lot of places go, ah, you know, they, they know how to ring things in. You know, they, they've got that part of it down. And I, I wanted to challenge everybody, step it up in 2017. Sure. Well, I mean, you, you make a good point because this, this person said, hey, I've had, it seems like service has fallen off a cliff. Mm -hmm. I'd noticed that, forward it along to you. It's the same experience you've had. You start writing this column and then you just keep coming up with item after item in ways that these bud tenders can do a better job, can better serve the public and their customers. Were you surprised when you got to 10 and you're like, oh my God, I, I could probably keep going. When I was at 18 and I was like, oh, I really <laughs> need to. I'm like, wait, some of these are umbrella things. Right, I can find uh, you know uh, a kind of big, big base uh, of experiences that I've had to draw on, mm -hmm. and then also getting feedback from other people and saying, "What have you been out there? What are you noticing?" And talking to bud tenders because this is the little secret: working with a bad bud tender is more frustrating than being served by one. I'm sure <laughs> because there are so many people that go, "Ah, oh, you're making us look bad. That's not the right information," and it, it's that frustrating, you know, coworker experience that people have. Bud tenders are some of the most vocal people. When I reached out, <laughs> <laughs> that's great, man. Well, I know that column, and and this is true with so many other great 
great and relevant pieces, but that column inspired another column, uh, and this one was titled, Why Bud Tenders Still Shouldn't Have Tip Jars. So, Jake, you, you're arguing that bud tenders shouldn't have tip jars out there, out there. Up or pitchforks. Please don't have pitchforks. <laughs> um, tell me, why was this piece important to write, mm -hmm. um, especially as it piggybacked off the commandments? Right. It was one of the largest, you know, in terms of personal feedback that I received, angry voicemail. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, people came yeah, in on that that. <laughs> <laughs> it was that one command, the the one commandment. Uh, and listen, I felt like. And I still feel this way, that tip jars are a little gauche, that we started off as a medical industry. There's still a lot of people that use recreational stores as de facto medical marijuana for them. Very true. And the expectation of having the jar there is that you will receive tips. Now, a lot of bud tenders very upset with this, but the ultimate conclusion of the piece was, hey, bud tenders need to be paid more, and that we should set a reasonable expectation for you know, what someone should make if they're dealing with people that are cancer patients or that are dealing with people that are on very limited budgets. And so there should be, I think, a little more money going to bud tenders or an opportunity to come up with kind of a different way of approaching bud tending, where maybe you have a lead bud tender that makes a little bit more like in a pharmacy, right? Uh, you, sure. have, you have your head pharmacist, and then you have people that are more dealing with stocking or cashiering that don't have to have the encyclopedic knowledge of a bud tender, because I would gladly wait an extra five minutes for someone to get done talking to the lead bud tender so that I could have better recommendations, but not everybody needs that. I love that idea because it's true. When I go to the pharmacy, you know, you deal with the administrative person and go through, and then do you have any questions with this? And it's right. like sometimes you do, and then they bring the big guns. Maybe you have to wait. Maybe you don't. But you know, this is medicine. Um, mm -hmm. That's medicine, and I think treating it as such, um, treating them similarly, makes a lot of sense. I liked another one of your points, and that is, you know, if your service industry, if you're waiting tables or bartending, and you're making that state minimum far below the minimum wage, those people rely on tips, but bud tenders and any other employees of modern marijuana shops, at least in this state, are making at least minimum wage and in often cases more. And so do they deserve a tip given that construct? And that's really hard for me because I came from you know bartending, serving uh, tables before that. So I very much relied on tips to pay my rent or explain you know why my rent was going to be late when <laughs> there were like slower days. And that's uh, one of the harsh realities of tipping. I didn't want to you know litigate tipping in general, but if you do the research, it's not a good system. And I don't think it works for a lot of people. So if you're one of those bud tenders that read that article and you go, I hate Jake Brown. Uh, I, I need these tips to you know make a living. Why well, challenge your employer to take care of you so that you don't have to rely on sick people uh, or tourists to pay your bills? You know you should earn a living wage as a bud tender. Living wage. Lots of talk around raised minimum wage in this in this new world. And mm -hmm. I, I know uh, Trump's pick for Department of Labor is very anti <laughs> a, a, a minimum wage hike. But moving on from that because we have more important things to talk about than Trump's picks. Um, I, I do want, well, more pressing matters here in the bud tender tipping conversation at least. Jake, I want to hear what your favorite response was to the piece. Oh, I had one comment that really stuck out to me is that it was, I believe a shop in Oregon has what they call a karma jar, but it's behind the counter. And if someone would like to tip, they simply say, listen, we don't accept tips here. That's not part of what we do. But if you'd like to leave a little bit of money in here, the next time we have a patient that's a little short, that, you know, oh, it came to a little bit too much, or, you know, if they just need a couple bucks, they reach in that jar, they pay it forward. And what a great and elegant solution, right? Very. It's full of class. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very elevated, I think. Yeah, I've seen other places, uh, you know, when Denver Relief was open, there was a little jar right there. And instead of taking tips, the money went to a college fund for a, a, a young man that Kayvon called Bari Mentors. And oh. I was like, oh, what a, what a great way to use that. And they would also give you a raffle ticket so that it would all go <laughs> into, and, and people won like a glass piece every week. It's these little things, these little nuances that I think are going to help Colorado's cannabis industry take the next steps. Sure. You know, you hear about programs in on the East Coast that are treated much more like a pharmacy, right? And, and while those are medical dispensaries on the whole, it's always important to remember that 
all of this started because of medical patients and the fact that we get to have recreational weed is great, but we always need to remember that there are people that need this. <laughs> It's very true, and you mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of people buying on the recreational side are buying for to treat a medical ailment, and they don't want to get the card, they don't want their name to be on a government registry, whatever their reason, right. it's something that's undeniable, and it has shown up in research that a lot of the people buying recreationally are patients treating something, trying to treat something. It's worth keeping that in mind, but, but Jake, you're also running another business, the Grow Off. I want to catch up on that. Um, you know, this is your cannabis growing competition. I appreciate it and wrote about it um, while acknowledging your role here at The Cannabis because yeah. it relies on science, not some pay for play event or taste testing judge. Um, where are you at in the grow off cycle? You know, how many competitors are there? What's up next? What's at stake? Uh, so it's crazy. We are in week 14 right now. Oh, and cool. the concept was we're going to give all of the growers identical genetics to start. So it's an apples to apples growing competition. They get six months to grow it however they'd like. It's also a mystery strain, so they don't know what they're doing. So there's experimentation. Uh, they're learning on the fly. And in a lot of cases, coming up with some really innovative ways of growing for this competition. So we have that going on. And then at the end, we're the only cannabis competition where no one gets high. So that's fun. Too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> instead of having kind of this panel of judges and all of you know their little you know oh I, I prefer OG oh I like you know sativa strains we're gonna say no we're just gonna go by lab results so we're doing cash prizes for potency for yield and for flavor and flavor I think is one of the really cool parts because now you can go in and you can get your terpene tests and that essentially it. breaks it down of who's growing the most flavorful weed which has become incredibly important especially in the concentrates market right now right. Absolutely. That, that people want those dabs that are super flavorful. And so if you can grow the product that just is bursting with it, then I think that's something that we need to acknowledge. Sure, And sure. now we can in science. That's it's amazing. I love it, man. Yeah. So when, do, when we, will we know winners? So we'll know winners. March 16th is the final deadline. So we have a few people that are in flower currently. We have one harvest already. And Whoa. they can cure however they'd like to huh. and then send it into the lab. And we'll be announcing uh, the final final winners in early April wow that's a long period of time well this is the thing we wanted to make sure <laughs> there's so many different growing styles out sure. there that we didn't want to put anybody at a disadvantage uh, by saying hey we're gonna shorten it up we wanted people to really have a chance to innovate because we really believe that science is going to be what's pushing this all forward we asked the growers for data as they go so that we can at the end of the competition come back and say hey you know, company A and company B were pretty similar, but they did this little thing differently. And so if you change that, you might increase your yield by 25%. And so there's a real added benefit to being in, uh, you know, other than just bragging rights and the cash prize. But <laughs> people want to know how to improve their process. And we've been amazed at how open growers are with us in terms of talking about how they do things and why they do it. Well, especially since there's so much unknown about that process. You know, every grower who comes in and sits on the couch and chats with us, mm -hmm. every grower grows the best, of course, you know, but, <laughs> but this is a qualitative approach to right. saying, okay, really, who got the most and who got the, who developed the most terpenes? Mm -hmm. It's fun. I can't wait for March and August or March and April. Yeah. We'll talk some more then, I'm sure, brother. Awesome. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're going to talk Good some time. more here shortly. Great. <laughs> uh, now, I want to throw to our very own Dr. of Dank. Of course, that's Professor Pat for this week's entry in the new oh, cannabis on. lexicon. Dabber, a metal, glass, or quartz tool which is used to gather up the concentrate and dab it onto the hot surface. Quote, I swear I will kill you if you steal my dabber one more time. Thank you for that, Professor Pat. Always appreciated. Uh, but now it is time to bring out our second guest, who has arranged for more than $25 million in loans and leases for cannabis businesses that oftentimes don't have access to traditional banking. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Scott Jordan to The Cannabis Show. All right. Hey, hey man. Hey, thank you. Happy Good holidays. to see you. Happy holidays to you, too. Oh, man, more I brought you, brought you a little something here. <laughs> yes, I thought uh, you have such a nice 
uh, cannabis <laughs> cup there, but look how nicely it matches uh, yes. Jake's gift. Look at that. We Dynamic even... alternatives finance. Yeah, we didn't even, yes. so we didn't even know that. So, well, I'm um, glad we're sending you guys home with some cannabis swag and yeah. mugs and all that ish. So. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's I've, good to I've see admired you your show and uh, I've seen you, you know, several times around town. It's great. I know. Great. Yeah, and I appreciate happy it holidays to everybody around. else out there. Yeah. Heck and yes. happy new year. Let's, 2017 is oh, going to be a great be year. We're going to be talking about this new year, Scott. Great. But first, where are you at on the spectrum of, of weed? Indica sativa. I love IPA. That's really my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> That's your answer, huh, That's, Scott? That, okay. So you're, you're not a consumer. I, uh, I love IPA, and uh, <laughs> uh, one of my favorite places is uh, just around the corner from where I live in Lone Tree. They make a great IPA. Which place? <coughs> Lone Tree Brewing Company. Oh, cool. Excellent. Yes. It's wonderful. Not far from there. Are you familiar with Dry Dock in Aurora? Yes. I like that Hef. Okay. And I don't even like beer, but somehow that Dry Dock Hefeweizen, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can get behind that. Yeah, good. <laughs> good. Uh, well, thank you for sharing your, your affinity Welcome. for IPA. That's important, too, especially, you know, the family cannabacea. It's all the same. Yes. It's all cousins, weed, hemp. Hops, so. And IPAs have a lot of hops. They do. <laughs> um, so Scott, as I just mentioned, uh, many cannabis businesses still don't have access to banking or those banking services that so often are taken for granted. Um, that includes loans. But um, you work with Dynamic Alternative Finance and you guys have found a way around this conundrum. So please tell me how this works. Sure, well, thank you very much for asking me that. Uh, what we do is we utilize private investors that uh, want to invest in the business, but don't necessarily have feet on the street. And so I am there, de facto feet on the street. And what we do is, is we find someone that's looking for money and we connect them up with someone that has money after doing some underwriting and some uh, analysis of that particular deal. And uh, we've been very successful in growing in about a year and a half uh, or so. We formed the company in uh, the summer of 2015. We've, we've uh, grown this tremendously and more and more investors are coming on board as well that want to um, help the industry grow as well as take advantage of above average returns. Oh, sure. So, so if I'm an investor and I don't know necessarily who is legit enough to invest in directly, I can come to you and say, hey, you're basically managing their assets and, and leveraging them um, with an industry that is in need of capital. More introduction uh, rather than managing their assets uh, because I don't claim to know who's going to be the next person that's going to go out of business or get oh, sure. bought. But um, what I try to do is uh, bring to them an opportunity that they wouldn't normally see because of, again, I'm out there, I speak at conferences, I uh, write articles, I do other things that cause uh, a lot of business to come my way. Oh, okay. Yes. So give us an example of how this works. Um, sure. uh, maybe a real company that you've worked sure. with, what did they need the capital for and how were you guys able to make it happen? Sure. Um, many of my customers I'm under NDA with, but one sure. that I can tell you about is a company called Dalton Farms. Dalton Farms is a company up in Boulder. They do uh, they grow um, wholesale and uh, sell wholesale, and they were at a very interesting point in their life cycle in that they were about a year into in, in the business and had not quite gotten traction as much as they would like to have financially and so um, they and they did not want to give up equity so um, we looked at putting together a deal that actually that actually came from uh, the credit union where we are one of their um, funding partners um, locally here and what we were able to do was we were able to bring in an investor that was going to go ahead and fund what they needed hmm. and was taking too long to actually get the deal closed. They had some, some uh, priorities that they needed the money for. We ended up switching horses in uh, midstream, took them to another private lender that ended up getting the deal done in less than a week. So oh, sure. the okay. beauty of our business model, I think that's, uh, 
really nice for the borrower is because we have multiple lending choices, we can affect different solutions than just um, a lender that has one single choice and only that choice um, you know, can do. So we were able to uh, meet his deadline as well as get him the money uh, and he was very, very happy and is now on his way um, uh, increasing the square footage and the lights in the greenhouse and uh, doing very well. Interesting. And, and with Dalton Farms, did they not have access to traditional <coughs> loans and banking services like we talked about? They did not. I mean, right now, um, there's only one credit union aside from uh, the one here in town that I know of that even entertains uh, loaning money because um, their boards are very conservative and they don't want to take a chance on losing money. And even if it wasn't federally illegal, very few banks are going to get into the business, I believe, because of the unknown. Um, we have such a short history, and no mm -hmm. one really knows how these companies are going to perform. And certainly in 2017, we've got the, uh, the wild card and the uh, new administration change that's sure. going to certainly... Um, be an altered landscape, and uh, in fact, I'd like to put in a, a pitch to perhaps come back on the show next year and talk about what the landscape is like next year yeah, uh, compared sure. to this year, because we've had a very good run. I mean, it's been a very nice, uh, I did my first marijuana loan in 2009, and it's been very nice having um, the Obama administration give us the room to be able to plant the seeds and grow this up into a real industry. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, now with the new administration coming up, we're not sure what that's going to uh, entail for us coming up in 2017. Well, you know, plus what's going to happen with, with banking, is there going to be movement made? And right now there are, it's worth saying, there are plenty of banks working with people in the industry. They're just not doing so publicly. They're doing it in very small, almost in experimental modes, and they're not spreading the word that, hey, weed industry, come to us for your banking services. And, and then loans is something entirely different than addition, in addition to getting just uh, a checking account. So It absolutely is. And uh, I have to give a big shout out to Sunday Seafried over at Partners Credit Union for really breaking down the door here in Colorado and providing access as well as she's written a book about uh, how she's done it. So the banks in other states and the credit unions in other states that want to take advantage of it now at least have a roadmap and a playbook on what they can do if they want to uh, attract this business. So just to try and nail this down even one level further, um, dynamic alternative finance, is what are the similarities there and the differences between it and like a venture capitalist or an organization like the Arcview Group, which invests in marijuana companies? Companies. Sure. Um, the difference is, is that venture capitalists are generally in on the very early stages of a company, mm. pre-revenue, where it's an idea and a concept and they haven't gotten revenue traction. Sure. Um, Arcview is a lot of that as well. A lot of uh, early stage companies, companies that have an idea but little revenue, but uh, Troy and Jeff, and again, big shout out to Troy and Jeff for what they've put together. Uh, What's in, up, in, Troy and in, Jeff? In, yes, Troy and Jeff, <laughs> right on. Um, and, and what they've put together, and uh, they've done a marvelous job in terms of helping early stage companies, and now they're helping uh, later stage companies as well get capital that they need in order to um, expand. One of the differences is, is, is that in ArcView, you go and pitch in front of many, many investors at once and the whole rest of the world. So the whole rest of the world knows your secrets. Sure. We are more like a private money, private source. You sit down with me one-on-one. -on -one, you're not um, revealing all of your intellectual property to the rest of the world. And as you mentioned, uh, this is in part about a higher than average interest rate that these investors uh, are getting. So what are the interest rates we're talking about here? What does that look like? Sure, they vary. We basically have three different food groups. We have real estate, we have equipment, and we have working capital. Real estate is the lowest, and I've got rates as low as 8% uh, on a 15-year fixed rate loan. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if for equipment, we're now in the uh, low teens, you know, 13, 14, somewhere in there. And for working capital, pretty similar. Um, uh, 15 is kind of about the average these days that we're seeing. Oh, okay. So okay. rates have come down 
quite a bit with the amount of competition, just like any other market. More competitors, you know, especially <laughs> for a commodity like money, and the rates are going to be lower. And um, I, I hope that trend continues here in 2017 once we get some clear direction from the administration. Well, I appreciate hearing that. You know, we've had a couple. Um, a couple folks on the couch before with their solutions to this conundrum of cannabis businesses wanting to bank. And I think all of them are so very interesting and oftentimes coming from really intelligent people, you know, saying, how can we help this industry still get access to the capital it needs without, you know, with while well, keeping them within federal regulations and guidelines. And so this is educational. I want to bring Jake back into the conversation, uh, open this up a little bit. This is kind of my year end wrap mm -hmm. uh, with with these questions <clears throat> on the last three shows of the year. Um, but we are approaching New Year's Eve, as we just talked about about and and I want each of you guys to tell me that if you had a New Year's resolution for the legal cannabis industry in America or beyond um, what is the one facet of legal marijuana that you'd like to see worked out in 2017 Jake why don't we start with you you know I think what I would love to see is lower potency, higher flavored marijuana. Mm. Scott would pro appreciate this. I would rather see more craft beer, less Everclear, sure. where it, everyone keeps racing to make pot more and more potent. And I think that that's great, and there's a use for you know super potent pot, but I'd love to see some stuff that was low THC, uh, maybe even ratio CBD to THC, and that people can smoke, you know, a big joint of while you're sitting around a fire and you don't have to worry about freaking out uh, <laughs> or like getting all quiet or anything like that. Because that's the one thing that I hear uh, from people is that they want to smoke the weed that they used to smoke back in the day. And, right. and there's, it's not out there. It's Isn't not that available. a trip? I hear from that, that, that from people all the time. It's like, how do I get that 4%, 5% THC right. stuff I used to buy from the brick? Yes. And, and it's like, oh, I don't know that you can. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't find swag right now if I tried. And that was <laughs> like what got me through high school and college. You sure, know? sure. So it's, it's so weird that no one's trying to fill that like little niche especially considering the story that you were talking about earlier, there's so many more boomers that are getting interested in pot, uh, people that are retired that are like, yeah, you know, smoke a little, why not? That'll be fun. Uh, but there aren't options for them other than, you know, edibles or vape pens that tend to be lower. But it's like, hey, we should be able to get a big old joint at the dispensary and fire that up. Because the problem with high potency stuff is it makes you paranoid uh, or makes you quiet. And, and then it's no longer a social drug, right? I'm mm -hmm. withdrawing. I don't want to be with these people or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about whatever. Whatever. Or the other thing is, if it's <laughs> super potent and you can only have one hit or something, then it's not a social experience of passing it around and, and having that community. So. And correct me if I'm wrong, because you are the expert, you are our critic. Um, I, I, and I don't smoke weed, <laughs> but <laughs> I do vaporize, I do eat it. But when you're smoking weed, you know, you have a nice joint, you have your fill, you put it out. Um, you relight it, you have your fill, you put it out, and then like later on that night, maybe you light it a third time and share it. That, I, I, am, I can't imagine that process makes that weed taste good. <laughs> if, you're, if you're like extinguishing it and then reigniting it and then, you know, is that good for the taste of a joint, for the integrity of the cannabis? So what I always tell people is that if you take a hit and you want to put it out, a lot of people will just let it rest there and it'll go out on its own a lot of times. But if you snuff it out and then blow through, so all that stale smoke isn't trapped in there with the rest of the bud, oh. it'll help out the flavor. So it, that's the problem is that stale smoke essentially is just going to sit there and absorb in. Mm -hmm. It's not going to make a huge difference. You know, it, I mean, by the time you're a third of a way through a joint, you're already lost a lot of the initial flavor that you're getting out of sure. it. Um, it's kind of like the you know end of a sandwich where it's like, oh, all this stuff's going to drip down into the bread. And it's like, oh, this isn't that fun. No one wants the end of a sandwich. You want the first bite or the second bite. I don't know. That's my favorite bite, the end of the sandwich. <laughs> the end of the sandwich bite? Yeah, oh. totally. All the lettuce juice, that important <laughs> lettuce juice. <laughs> lettuce juice? What's wrong with you? No, Who hurt you? <laughs> Who made you sandwiches growing up? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, I, I, I like this idea of a refocus on, on, on flavor mm -hmm. instead of potency. I think that's, um, that's a really dynamic call and a good tip on for those extinguishing joints for later use. Um, Scott, where are you at on this question? One thing, one facet yeah. of legal marijuana you hope to see yeah. improved, worked out next year. Yeah. I would love to see that um, the, the uh, 
business owner has access to banking and banking services. I saw and, that one coming. And, <laughs> you know, it just seems to be so unfair and so hypocritical that, uh, that the government will take tax revenues, whether it's in cash or um, whatever form, but they won't allow the legal marijuana business owner that's abiding by all the laws be able to um, deposit money into a bank as well as um, pay, you know, uh, uh, with electronically like every other sure. business does. Um, secondarily, I'm going to slip this one in. I'm hoping 280E <laughs> is going to be resolved and uh, sure, another and, and finance change issue. because it just is unfair and was never designed. That law was never designed for the legal marijuana business owners, and it's unfair that they're saddled with this 30 percent or so higher amount of uh, of taxes, and in some cases, they're not able to actually make money when they have to factor in. Um, the expenses that they are unable to deduct. So. Both big goals. Um, I'm sure many people agree with you and, and, and hope that there is some change on those fronts next year. But tell me this, Scott, because uh, this seems to go against your own interests. If they it does. Legalize, if if banking is suddenly okay, then you're absolutely your right. Clients. It does, but it's more important for the industry sure. to grow than for just my company and myself to profit. And I hope that. Um, the banking laws will be relaxed, and I hope that uh, the marijuana business owners will get treated fairly, because right now they're treated like third-class citizens. Sure. And I don't think that that's right, no matter how it affects me and my pocketbook. Well, for any listeners, uh, viewers watching right now, and if you're not familiar with 280E, which is an IRS tax code, Google it right now, and you will know what we're talking about. Google it with uh, Cannabis Show in the search and watch the clip where John Lord explains it to there you. There you go, yeah, there Does you go. Has anyone asked you what your resolution is? Oh, wow. My, well, you know, as a journalist, traditional journalist, we're not really making our opinions known all that often. So that's why you guys are here. You guys have all these opinions, <laughs> and, and they're valuable, and they're mm -hmm. valid, and I'm so thankful for you guys sharing them. Me. I don't really have an opinion on this that I'm sharing right now, but uh, <laughs> but I, I, I hope that, uh, yeah, I, I will say this. I hope the cannabis continues to thrive um, in 2017 because we just got November numbers and this has not been reported yet, although we will very soon. And we just had a monster November. Yeah. Uh, we got ComScore numbers for the month of November. Thank you to our readers and our viewers and our listeners. You really are telling your, your, your most trusted people in your life about uh, what we're doing here. And we're extremely proud of it, including 1.2 million unique users in November. We beat High Times. We beat Marijuana.com. Very, wow. very proud. And we're hoping that c growth continues. So that's my cool. hope for yeah. 2017. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> Self-serving. Thanks. But, thanks. That's okay, <laughs> but you didn't cheer in the press box, so that's good, right? <laughs> yes. No cheering in the press box. Oh my God, that Super Bowl in New York City, Broncos <laughs> losing to Seattle Seahawks, and all the Seattle journalists cheering in the press box. It's unethical, I tell you. <laughs> anyway, it's time for the pot quiz, gentlemen. Oh, yeah. I hope you're ready. Put on my thinking cap. Oh my word, oh, what is oh, Jake boy. Brown doing over here? Listen, I can't get skunked again. <laughs> <laughs> I have the worst pot quiz record. Scott, you're, you're in good hands with this one. Oh boy, okay. Impressive. Uh, did you bring your thinking cap? Uh, you know what, I left it in the car, but um, I will <laughs> make right. sure that I have it next time. <laughs> you're gonna have to go with that. You're, you'll be All showing right. up in like July yeah. with a Santa yeah. hat. And you'll be like, why? <laughs> okay, Jake, we're starting with you. Yeah. The rules are simple. If you get the answer wrong, you can steal it, Scott, and vice versa. So, Jake Brown, are you ready? I guess. Drum roll. <laughs> that was the That's correct readiness good. for you. <laughs> that is the sound you want to hear, too. That is the ding. Yeah. Jake, the president of what South American country accepted the Nobel Peace Prize last week while encouraging other world leaders to rethink the war on drugs? Oh gosh, why is it always questions about South America when I'm here? <laughs> name I'm the country like, gonna... and we'll give you a bonus point if you can name the president. I'm going to guess Chile and I cannot guess the president. <laughs> that is not the right oh. answer, but that does Hot help. Quiz. Scott, you know it's not Chile. Oh boy. Um, what South American country 
Um, this president just accepted the peace prize and said we should rethink the war on drugs. Was it Uruguay? It was not. Okay. All right, no points on the first Are question, but Scott, we're coming to you with the second question. All right. The, the correct answer, answer was yeah. Colombia. Oh, and Juan yes. Manuel Santos was the president. <laughs> oh, won the Nobel Peace Prize. Juan Manuel Santos. Yeah, Colombia. He won big award. Uh, he won the Peace Prize for kind of coming to some sort of an agreement between the government and a rebel group that was largely responsible for a lot of the drug trafficking within Colombia. Oh, Very cool story. Check him out. Oh. He's done important work down there. Completely changed in the game in South, uh, South America and North America as well, since we've gotten so much of our substances from <laughs> Colombia. So, um, Scott, the next question comes to you. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. The Republican governor of this U.S. territory is pushing to legalize recreational marijuana and, quote, tax the heck out of it, end quote. What U.S. territory is it? Puerto Rico? No. No ding. You don't hear that bell. You know there's a problem. Jake for the steal. Can I get a Guam? Oh, that is a that is a ding. That is a correct answer. I'll take it. Jake will create his own dings if he needs to. Apparently. Well done. Yes, Guam. I don't know uh, any other U.S. territories. I, was gonna say, I, I think that's the only other one other than the U.S. Virgin Islands, maybe. Oh, it's yeah, it's Vince, because that was going to be my guess. Yeah. Okay, we take another the coin on that one. Or, uh, you you know, that do one. you remember the other U.S. territory we had? the weekend weed like three months ago was it the uh American Samoa? it was it was no, not american it samoa it wasn't the virgin islands it was the oh, i had it on the tip of my tongue and just lost it anyway there's lots more american territories but those are the two most famous <laughs> yeah. congrats on the correct answer we're back at you jake all right here is the question a little bit closer to home recreational cannabis became legal in what u.s state this week jake mm -hmm. <laughs> Maine? Oh, I am so happy no. that, that one I know. And I can't wait to talk about why. <laughs> okay, that Scott one I do know. Where, where I went to college <laughs> in good old Wellesley, Massachusetts, oh, you can state. now <laughs> legally possess, possess, use, use grow. grow. Rifa. Yes. Rifa. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, yes. so are we at 1-1? One, one? I think so. I think so. Both uh -oh. on steals, I think. Tight. Okay, so this last question All right. could determine the winner or could determine a tie, which mm. is always fun. All right. Um, Scott, we're coming at you. You get the first guest here. Recreational marijuana will soon be legal in what U.S. state? after opponents recently dropped a request for a recount on the recent ballot initiative. All right. Up in Maine. Uh oh Scott brought it. Scott brought hey. the A-game. That was a good point. Hey. I believe you, that means Jake has to relinquish his crown now. <laughs> the thinking cap. The thinking oh. cap didn't do much good, although it matched beautifully. Thank I have to say, I'm a slave to this fashion. is a real match. It looks like some Celtics, some old Celtics throwback. Oh, you know, you know it. You know, Adidas? Don't is let that? anyone in Massachusetts know that I just lost I'm them. letting everybody in Massachusetts know. <laughs> oh my god. Sorry, guys, I'm, just, I'm still reeling from the Patriots game. Uh, hey, you guys won. <laughs> it wasn't pretty, Perhaps. but. It wasn't pretty. It never is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, props to you guys. What a pleasure. Thank Always you. Always a pleasure, Jake. And Scott, so. I, you will be back talking, Thank banking you. with us when we know more about I, what it's going to look I like. I can't wait. I'm going to put it on my for, calendar. For the here. annual Scott Absolutely. Jordan holiday show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to thank my guests, Jake Brown and Scott Jordan, but most importantly i want to thank you all for watching listening and telling your friends about the cannabis show uh i'm ricardo baca that's vince that's don that's pat the rest of the crew have a great day everyone and we will see you next week right. i'm allowed to lose the truth to win i'm all in i'm calling any pots that you'll be raising at the end i'll say it again ain't afraid to get in i'll be going for the jackpot with ace in my hand i'm raw